I'm Jonathan Mordak. I'm a professor of public policy and economics at New York University's Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. And I'm Rachel Schneider, Senior Vice President at the Center for Financial Services Innovation. The U.S. Financial Diaries Project grew out of a project abroad, trying to understand the day-to-day -day financial lives of the world's poor. That work helped shift ideas about poverty and finance in a global setting. The Ford Foundation had supported part of that work, and together with the City Foundation, they proposed that we try something similar in the U.S. The Omidyar Network then later joined as an additional funder. So we formed a collaboration led by NYU's Financial Access Initiative, the Center for Financial Services Innovation, and Bankable Frontier Associates. We started by choosing sites across the country to reflect the different parts of the American economic experience. We worked in San Jose, California, and the agricultural communities to its south. We worked in eastern Mississippi, east of Jackson and north of Hattiesburg. We spent time in the greater Cincinnati area, both where the Ohio River divides Ohio and Kentucky, and also in small towns nearby. The last site was in Brooklyn and Queens in New York City, close to our offices in downtown Manhattan, but in some ways really very far apart. We spent time in big cities, small cities, and small towns. About a third of the families were below the federal poverty line. About a third were above the federal poverty line, but still struggling. And another third was what might be called middle class, really around regional median incomes. The focus was on working families, though some families had older members. Our aim was to capture typical experiences not to form a representative sample of the United States. Other surveys can do that much better. We wanted a fairly small sample to be able to get to know the families as individuals, hear their stories, and then to be able to tell their stories. The goal of this research is to identify big trends that can be hard to see in surveys. And that comes from spending a lot of time with families, listening to how they describe their problems and seeing how they confront them. The biggest innovation in this research approach is really about collecting data on cash flows. Our goal was to collect data on every single dollar that the families earned, every dollar they spent, and every dollar they saved, borrowed, and shared. Whether it was electronic or in cash, whether it was formal or informal, whether it was in a big bank, a credit union, or at a pawn shop or payday lender. In the summer of 2014, I was invited to spend a week in the research group at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. One thing that struck me was how good the data is on economics and finance in America, but in a different way, how limited it is. Survey evidence is fairly rich on people who've used payday lenders or pawn shops, for example, or other forms of small dollar credit. But surveys are less good on what happened to similar people in similar situations who didn't happen to end up at the payday lender, or what happened before and after payday borrowing. Borrowing from pawn shops and payday lenders is not a big part of the story in the financial diaries. That's consistent with other evidence from across the country and bigger data sets. People turn more often to borrowing from credit cards or borrowing from family and friends. Still, about a third of the families borrowed from alternative sources at least once during the study, and some used them pretty heavily. The most important providers were store credit, payday, and pawn shops, like this one on the main street of a town we visited in Northern California. Julie Sawicki is a research associate with the Financial Diaries Project. She's based in New York now, but she spent a year in the Cincinnati site as a field researcher. Julie introduces us to two of the families that she came to know during the study. I met two families in the field who come to mind when I think about small dollar credit. One struggled with debt and overspending and used payday loans often. The other family also used them, but less frequently. They borrowed to solve liquidity problems and repaid quickly, and the loans helped them through some difficult times. Joan and Danny Sawyer live with their four kids in a home that they own. They have a steady stream of funds from three incomes, two full-time and one part-time. Shortly before I met them, 
Joan had started a new job with lower pay than she was used to. The household began using payday loans to help them continue their previous, still modest, standard of living. In July, they borrowed first to cover an overdue water bill. When it was due, they took out another in order to afford a student loan payment coming up. Their July payday borrowing totaled $425. In August, they took out double that, two loans totaling $825. In September, they borrowed because of an unexpectedly short paycheck. Their plan was to borrow $50 less each loan cycle. They couldn't stick to it and ended up waiting until after their tax refund came to pay off their payday loan debt. But just two months later, they fell back into the bi-weekly borrowing pattern. At first, the Sawyer's payday loans were not a problem as much as an enabler, a coping mechanism that allowed the family to live beyond their means. But the Sawyer's were financially insolvent. Instead of helping them, short-term credit ultimately became a major part of their difficulties. Kelly lives in a Cincinnati suburb. She also used payday loans during the year we spent with her. Kelly is an upbeat presence. She's a single mother with three kids in middle and high school. She once said, I can hang drywall. I can patch a roof. I can bake a cake. That's what happens when you always have to do everything. She confided that part of the reason she joined the diary's study was to have another adult in her life. During the study, Kelly earned income taking care of other families' children as part of a public program. Her boyfriend also contributed $500 a month to help with expenses, and she got a big tax refund in February. Money is tight for Kelly. For example, her daughter had to wait a year to get her driver's license because Kelly couldn't afford the extra $135 in auto insurance. Kelly said... I don't save. Every bit of money we get is budgeted out between bills and things I owe around the house. Rent is always paid first, but my landlord is flexible. Gas, electric, and water bills go after that. Netflix is at the bottom. So if money is tight, I'll cancel Netflix and work my way up. Kelly paid for her kids' health expenses with a medical card from the state but Kelly wasn't covered, and it put her in some risky situations. She has asthma, and if she has an attack, she needs to get help. Some of the medication they prescribe costs $300. In response to that price, Kelly says, Oh my God, I'm not going to get that. I told the doctor I wouldn't buy a $300 inhaler. You're wasting your time if you write the script. She ends up getting a discounted inhaler from a regional charitable pharmacy. She said, I'm supposed to use it twice in the morning and twice at night, but I'm doing it once in the morning so that it lasts longer. Kelly also needs glasses to see things at a distance. She can't afford an eye test, so makes do with glasses from the drugstore. Kelly has never had any credit cards. She said, you end up paying more into them than you're actually spending. I saw my mom with her credit cards, and I said no. Early in the study, we asked her what she would do if she needed to come up with $150 in one week. She said she'd do it by borrowing from her friends or family. Kelly gave the same answer when we asked about $500 she'd borrow from her family. She said, if I need cash for something, I usually borrow it from someone I know. My mom's good for it. I'll usually go to her house and work it off, like mowing the lawn. She'd give me a couple hundred, possibly a thousand, but I've never asked. When we asked Kelly about a $2,000 emergency, she said she'd have to borrow from a bank or credit union. Sometimes she asked her daughter's father for help, but that carried its own costs. Kelly said that when she borrows from him, he then feels permission to be mean and point out her faults. Without credit cards and having to rely on the generosity of family, Kelly sometimes turned to the payday lender instead. She explained, Normally I could get $180. They go off what you make weekly and charge a $32 fee on top. 
Of course, this fee comes out to several hundred percent APR. But that's not how Kelly saw it. She took out payday loans a couple times, once in September and once in January, when she didn't get child support payments as expected. She also borrowed several times from family and friends during the year. In Kelly's mind, at least, taking payday loans was a smarter option than having a credit card in her wallet, with all the temptation that comes with it. The big question, in the end, is whether better options can be created for short-term borrowers like Kelly and whether it's possible to differentiate between borrowers spending beyond their means, like the Sawyers, or, like Kelly, struggling for sure, but not sinking, 